Hello and welcome. I'm Matthew Robertson, and I'm director of music at Bradley Hills Presbyterian Church. And on behalf of the church and Bethesda Jewish congregation, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this sacred space where weekly Muslims, Christians, and Jews gather in worship and in song. Um, my welcome also goes out to my friends at the Washington Bach Consort and to dis today's distinguished panelists, many of whom are dear friends and dear colleagues. Today's conversation, which sits at the nexus of interfaith dialogue and the arts, is well placed in this space, which has not only been a home for many years for interfaith worship and interfaith dialogue, but also for many excellent musical performances. In this topic, anti-Semitism and anti-Judaism in Bach St. John Passion is one that has been at the front of my mind, conducting the piece many times over the last decade and a half. And I submit that it is one that every lover of Bach's music should consider in their appreciation of his work. It's my hope that today's conversation will provide a new and important lens through which we can view Bach's work and his St. John Passion in particular. In conclusion, I'd like to welcome Ian Pomerantz, who is moderator of today's discussion. Those of you who are um, Bradley Hills folks might recognize Ian from when he sang the Mozart Requiem solos when we performed the piece back in 22. Um, so welcome Ian and welcome friends and uh, hope you have a productive discussion. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Uh, and thank you to the Bethesda Jewish congregation and uh, to our friends at Bradley Presbyterian Church for hosting this very important conversation uh, with this distinguished panel, uh, Washington Bach Concert, Break the Rules. This is not intended to be just a pre-concert lecture, but a conversation that includes the community the most affected by anti-Semitism in a frank and thorough conversation. Um, everyone in this room tonight is a part of music history. So, uh, oh, and online as well. So congratulations. Uh, our time tonight is short, traffic is bad, so I will ask everybody to keep that in mind. Um, we will start uh, with a conversation about the text of St. John's Passion and Bach's libretto itself, and then expand into the greater context of the work, its music, and the many, many performance issues that it presents uh, to musicians and organizers. And then we're going to finish with a discussion about anti-Semitism in our own world and uh, how it impacts people's lives today. Um, I also want to say that all of our questions, about 50-50, um, were either sub uh, submitted to me directly by the public um, or by uh, members of the Jewish or musical communities, and uh, half of them come from uh, my discussions with one-on-one uh, -on -one with the panel. So uh, with that, um, let's dive right in. Um, I would also invite you to read the uh, amazing bios of our panel. Um, I, wish, I wish we had time for me to go, go through all their incredible accomplishments and uh, their these incredible uh, resumes, um, but I will, uh, I will refer you to uh, the website, um, BethesdaJewish.org, is that correct? Uh, slash Bob panel, and you can read all about these uh, fabulous professionals, these musicologists, these colleagues, these musicians, and these state leaders. Um, so let's uh, dive right in um, with some questions uh, for uh, both uh, Dr. Marison and Dr. Cyprus. Uh, first, Dr. Marison, what is the Gospel of St. John? And how does the Gospel of St. John differ from the other canonical Gospels in its treatment of the Jews, particularly in the Passion story? Yeah, okay, I'm not gonna say too much because I wanna play a couple of music examples that will speak to, to this question, but the sort of Reader's Digest version of it is that there are four canonical gospels whose uh, one of their main purposes is to uh, project who Jesus is and why he's important and so on. And uh, without the Gospel of John, you'd have no classical Christianity. The Mark, Matthew, and Luke are, do um, important things. Too, but we wouldn't be where we are at all without the Gospel of John, extremely important um, document in the history of Christianity. 
And what the Gospel of John is keen to um, promote is the idea that Jesus was sent by God as God's Messiah. And where this affects the question of Judaism is who are some people believe that he was sent by God and some people did not believe that he was sent by God. And those who believe that he was sent by God were called brothers in the technical term in the Gospel of John. And people who do not believe, uh, people from ethnic Israel who do not believe that Jesus was sent by God as God's Messiah were called Yudha Oi. And there's been much discussion about how this should be translated and so on. It doesn't, at a certain level, it doesn't matter because as far as the box, John Passion is concerned, uh, Luther translated that as the Juden, which means the Jews. And my own view for what it's worth, although I'm not a biblical scholar, is that uh, the Greek term does mean that too. Although I understand the other challenges involved. However you translate it, it it's a negative, it's the negative counterpart to the brothers is the, is the, is the important part. And uh, the Gospel of John is quite forceful about this. So the, this is where I'll bring in my quick music examples. Um, there's sort of three really important things that happen in the Gospel of John on the question of the relationship of the brothers to the um, to the uh, to the Jews in this in the story, and it's in John eight that Jesus is depicted as saying to Jews a whole bunch of nasty things, but he sort of uh, ends up saying at the end. And I've had many of my uh, Christian friends say, "Is that really in there?" I'm sorry to say, yeah, it is. In John 8, it says, uh, Jesus is depicted as saying, uh, you, you people are uh, murderers or killers and liars, and you are killers and liars by nature. That's the, it was quite a, and this, this is something that box audiences would have been familiar with because it was read in the liturgy weeks before the uh, Passion would have been performed. And so they would have understood the Passion story, which is, of course, uh, the, Jesus being put to death by the Roman authorities, partly brought, uh, brought to the Roman authorities by, um, uh, by these, uh, those people called the, we can call them the J or something, if we don't know how we want to translate that. And uh, so the idea is that, that Jesus in a way is kind of prophesying the Prussian narrative already at the, towards the beginning of the gospel. And then it's worked out in the actual story itself. And that's what Bach's John Passion is, is Luther's translation of John 18 and 19 uh, verbatim, and then it breaks off for commentary after each verse in the, in the story. And the quick thing I would say about that is that uh, people often ask, well, how does Bach compare, if we, how does, if we already say, how does John compare to the other gospels? John's much nastier on this mm -hmm. question. How is Bach compared to other composers from the time? Is he sort of typical? And the generalization I would make is that Bach is much, much more forceful and nasty in his depiction of the biblical story and much, much less so in the commentary on the story. Whereas most other Baroque composers, the other way around, and, and we'll, you'll, you'll be able to hear this uh, right now, um, the, the commentary is extremely nasty. You filthy Jew, get your dirty hand off my savior, that kind of thing. Uh, but so, the, the depiction of the actual characters in the story is much more tame than most other composers. In, in, in box, for box audience, is there any doubt that this is the Jews we are talking about. Could Bach's audiences have interpreted this narrative in any other way? And does any evidence exist that tells modern scholars such as yourself um, how Bach's original audience would have interpreted this work? Oh yeah, it's totally straightforward. They absolutely thought it was Jews. <laughs> and it was completely uncontroversial. Um, and as when I get to the third part then and because uh, i'm going to play three basic examples then for you I'm gonna, uh, is, um, there isn't a musical setting of J jesus setting it up like that but the um what i want to play for you is a brief example from a Telemann passion at the point in the narrative in the passion narrative where Pilate, the govern roman governor says to the jews why don't you take them and you know take care of them according to your own law and their response is uh, we're not allowed to put someone to death according to our law, which is true. That's a, a straightforward, factual, historically true thing, which we won't dilate on now. And most composers, when they, have, when they depict the group of Jews singing that in the narrative, they do it just sort of very straightforwardly. So that's what the Telemann setting with all the play for you just in just a second. And then the Bach setting is absolutely ferocious after that. It's five times as long. They, instead of saying it twice, he says, like, I lost count after 30. And I mean, it's, 
what I want to say is sort of like that old Groucho Marx thing. Who are you going to believe these colleagues who say that there's no trouble whatsoever in Bach's music, or your lying ears? <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and then I'll contrast that very quickly with the kind of music, because the choir, in the performance of Bach's John Passion, the choir is constantly shifting between depicting groups of people in the narrative, singing the kind of thing that we were just talking about, or they're singing a, a stanza from a hymn that comments on what just was happening in the narrative. So a lot of people say, well, just don't pay attention to the words, just listen to the beautiful music and then there's no problem. Uh, apart from the ethical poverty of such a, an intellectual poverty of such a view, it also doesn't actually work. Because what I found over and over in my many, many years in this business is that people who aren't paying attention to what's being said by whom, they assume that the fast, noisy stuff, that's the Jews, and the slow, peaceful stuff, that's the Christians. And that's not entirely wrong, but, uh, but it's, it's, in, it's in that direction. So here's Telemann's setting of the Jews saying we have no, we're not allowed to put anyone to do it. That's it. Now check this out. That's one kind of choir music. Here's the other kind of choir music. Gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. Okay, you, you get the idea. I won't uh, take the time to play um, the other choral example I was going to play, but I'll just briefly mention it and then I'll turn things over to my other folks here. But the, the part three of John's, the gospel of John's relationship to the Jewish question as it relates to Bach's setting of the St. John Passion is that then after the Passion narrative, uh, or it's actually in the story, in the gospel, it happens in chapter 16, so it's before, but um, Jesus is depicted as saying to his followers that, um, watch out, uh, there's a time coming when they, the Jews, will come and they will kill you. And in doing so, they will think that they are doing God a service. And Bach set that text verbatim to ferocious choral music in Cantata 44, which I won't play now because I don't want to take up too much time. And that, that church cantata then echoes uh, uh, some of the, um, if you sort of squint your ears when you're listening to Cantata 44, it sounds a little bit like that chorus that we just, that we just heard. And I think that's not coincidental because it's sort of considered the way you would depict something when you're talking about this sort of thing, when you're a great composer like Bach, writing this stuff. So a you know, choir says, this is really fun to sing, you know, it's really virtuosic and it's exciting and so on. Yeah, but you know, like at, at, uh, at what cost? So, but, but, so the final thing I'll say then is how is, this, how is this business about they are going to kill you, I think they're doing a service, but how does that relate to the jump? Well, it turns out that um, even in Bach's day, Lutherans would read uh, Luther's table talk and so on. He says, don't get yourself a Jewish doctor. You know why? That Jewish doctor is going to kill you. <laughs> you know why? Because it says in John 16, there's a time coming. <laughs> and Lut the, Luth the language that Luther, he doesn't even quote, he assumes that people know that text. from the, He doesn't say, as it says in John 19, he just uses the lingo from that. You're just supposed to know the, the connection. So these were very real and live uh, Issues. The only other thing I'll say is that there was no Jewish community in Leipzig to, for um, people to rail against. So this was this extreme railing um, was was not socially motivated. It's, it's theologically motivated. They're really upset about the idea that there could be people out there who don't believe that 
Jesus was sent by God as his Messiah. So thanks for listening. Now, a century after Bach's death, uh, the figure of Richard Wagner uh, looms large as considerably more anti-Semitic than his contemporaries in the Germany that often thought of itself as an enlightened and tolerant nation. Now, does Bach and his librettists stand out as particularly anti-Semitic, even in the context of the anti-Semitism of his contemporaries? And if not, do we risk scapegoating Bach um, for one of the original sins that belongs to Christianity, that is anti-Judaism? Um, there's even a developing theory among some of our colleagues uh, that Bach himself wasn't even that religious. Um, could, could, you, could you speak to that? <laughs> Actually, be polite. It's absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> it's absurd. I mean, Bach is uh, Bach had a huge personal library of theological books, which you wouldn't expect a musician to have. And the one copy from his that one personal copy of his that survives is heavily marked with underlinings and comments in the margin in his handwriting, including things about our topic uh, here, which we can talk about if we if we want. Uh, Later, but the, so the only thing I'll quickly say is that um, uh, it has been said that in Leipzig, things were, the Enlightenment was sort of kicking in right. during Bach's lifetime, and he must have been gone along with that sort of thing. Well, as it happens, we just discovered recently that um, he was pr performing passion settings by other composers than himself, also, for example, on Good Friday. And in 1734, he performed a piece by Gerhard uh, Gottfried. It's hard. His name is even hard to say, and I won't. Play, I have an example here too, but I won't play it too. But uh, I was fell over backwards when I heard the first live performance of it in at the Bach Festival in Leipzig a few years ago, and uh, one of the movements starts: "Verdammte Jude, hör, was hier ein Heide spricht." Uh, listen, damned Jew, to what this Gentile has to say to you. If you don't want to have Jesus as your king, then you can go on. You can go on straight to hell. That's what the literal translation is. This was performed in Leipzig in the Thomas Church in 1734. So people say all kinds of things because, you know, they love, I love Bach. <laughs> we all love Bach. It's fantastic. Um, but because some people think that if you really love something that you're not allowed to see any problem whatsoever with it anywhere. Um, and so things that are demonstrably and ferociously factually untrue <laughs> are thrown out all the time. It's just it's maddening. Anyway, that's OK. Sorry, I, I talked too much. I, I, want, to, I want to bring uh, 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 Dr. Seifus into this conversation. Please. Um, <laughs> hey, is there anything that can be done textually to make Bach's passion, according to St. John, less anti-Semitic? Some approaches that have been done by other ensembles include um, removing the umlaut from uh, Juden to Juden, which is what we are doing, or removing the word altogether and just having it say Leute, or meaning the people, or the shah, uh, the crowd. Um, uh, does that help? What does that do to the text? Does that assuage uh, the, the, uh, the anti Semitism that is already viewed in the text? I don't know if I haven't. Sorry, of course, I'm going to drop my paper the first thing. Um, Ian, thank you, and Michael, thank you. I, I don't know if I have an answer to that. I mean, I think that there are different choices that people can make um, and see how it sits with them. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to sort of give down law on this. Right, of course. Um, you know, I, I think recognizing that Bach's music was adapted and changed from the really the moment he gave birth to it, in a sense, um, is, is sort of a key to um, these questions. Um, so when, for example, Felix Mendelssohn uh, revived the St. Matthew Passion in 1829, he did not perform the original version. He didn't right. perform, you know, a historically informed or, or correct version. He right. changed it. Um, he didn't change these aspects of the Matthew Passion, but he changed other things. He changed musical things. He made cuts. He reorchestrated it. So is that a solution? I think it's a solution. Um, but I think if it gives us an excuse or allows us to feel like we can then ignore the messiness that's involved in this topic, then I think we should not do it. Um, and, and I, you know, if it's okay, I'll pull back Please. from, from the John Passion in particular to kind of think about the larger context. And we talked a little bit about the kind of this broader theological 
context. I'm a, I'm a musicologist, I'm not a, um, a, a theologian, um, but you know, my understanding is that early modern Leipzig, Saxony, really much of Europe, um, certainly Lutheran Europe, was founded on a, a, a theology that stated that um, the, the message that the Jews had received, you know, as part of the Hebrew Bible, what's often by Christians called the Old Testament, um, was now outdated. Um, and, and rendered irrelevant, and it was taken over. Um, so the, the heirs to the Hebrew Bible, the, the kind of chosen people in the Hebrew Bible, were, uh, were the modern-day Christians, and, and in fact, Lutherans. And you um, call that su su successionist, su successionist theology. theology, sure. Right. Um, there, yeah, there are different, different terms that are used for it. Um, but this idea that there was really, so if you accept that modern day or 18th century Lutherans in Bach's world were the heirs to um, that chosenness that's described in the Hebrew Bible, um, then there's no foundation at all for the persistence of Judaism. Um, and so, yeah, when, when people write about, you know, the, the Juden, they're writing about Neue Juden. They actually describe modern Jews as the, the ones whom they're uh, you know they uh, they go into into synagogues and describe the music of the Neue Juden as being you know music of noise and music of chaos and uh, disharmony um, and so there, there certainly is a kind of a, a continued equation of the immorality and errancy the mistakes made by uh, supposed mistakes made by the Jews you know at the time of Jesus um, and the continued the persisting mistakes that, that Neue Jews, the modern day 18th century Jews were making in continuing in their stubbornness to reject Jesus as Messiah. This is the, this is the theory. Um, and so to that extent, even when we talk about, you know, the beginnings of enlightenment starting to take root in Leipzig and maybe Bach was kind of aware of these things. And I think, you know, Michael has really comfortably, uh, to my comfort anyway, described, you know, that you sort of refuted these claims that Bach was, you know, sort of becoming enlightened as he went and, um, and adopting some of these ideas. But even if we accept that he was taking over some of these enlightened ideas, that enlightenment was an enlightenment of tolerance and not an enlightenment of acceptance. So Jews were tolerated to the extent that maybe they could be converted. Maybe they weren't by nature evil, but they, they, could, they had some spark in them that would allow them to see the light, adopt Christianity, convert, and, th and that was the extent to which they were tolerated, if at all. Although, again, as Michael said, there were, there were, there were no Jews in Saxony at the time because they weren't allowed to live there. They had been expelled, um, as they had been from, from so many places in Europe. Uh, maybe more than you bargained. You know that that's, <laughs> that's 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 wonderful, and and you're you're referring to the music libel against the Jews, um, which is a, a wonderful a wonderful book by our colleague uh, Ruth Cohen, uh, which shows kind of how it, it entrenched aesthetic and theological assumptions, how persistently defined European culture and its internal moral and political or orientations in regards to the Jews from the very first centuries uh, of European Christianity. Um, and I think the uh, core, uh, core of her argument is that she demonstrates that in the Christian musical theology of the time, Jewish noise and idealized Christian harmony will always be in conflict with each other. Now, in Bach's time, I think this meant that Jews were seen as unable to express themselves musically because of their spiritual bankruptcy. Um, uh, indeed, I, I was I go to school in Germany, and one and one of the first times I went there. Um, I heard uh, the expression laut wie ein Judenschul, like noisy as a synagogue, um, which is still an expression that is occasionally used, especially in East Germany, which is where Leipzig is and where Bach lived. Um, now in the 19th and 20th centuries, to show a little bit of a continuity in anti-Semitism, these kind of metamorphosized into racial pseudoscience that Jews cannot express themselves, um, not through pleasing vocal music, not only because they were spiritually inferior, but also because they were racially uh, inferior. Um, in 2009, when I was a student, I was told by a famous German leader singer at a master class in Switzerland that as a result of my Jewish anatomy and my Jewish physiology that I will never be able to produce 
uh, the refined sound is that it's required by the German language, try as I may, um, and I might as well quit while I'm ahead. I bet he's <laughs> um, eating his words now, Ian. You know, <laughs> <laughs> no, this is, this is all to say, um, does the music that is sung by the Jewish mob in St. John's Passion throughout the story differ from the arias and the chorale movements that the faithful uh, sing that are punctuated in the book and in the narrative? Um, and taking all that into consideration, even if we are to remove the text completely um, from Bach's piece and solely present it as an instrumental work, is anti-Semitism anti still imbued in the very music of the Passion set? So I, I'm going to hear, hear cite a, a, a cultural historian whose work I was reading on the train down here um, named Lars Fischer, who um, sort of describes the air, the environment mm -hmm. um, of Bach's Leipzig as one that was because of this successionist theology, one that was essentially anti-Jewish. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that um, Ruth Cohen's book, The Music Libel Against the Jews is um, sort of a modern day gospel. It's a really wonderful book and I highly recommend it. She doesn't really talk too much about the 18th century. Mm -hmm. um, and she herself you know, admits that that's sort of not, it's not her area. Right. Um, and in fact, there, I, I'll just mention, I'm eagerly awaiting a dissertation that's being written right now at Northwestern um, by Paul Gustav right. Feller Simmons, which is looking at some of the, um, the historical records, things like tax records, things where you would not expect to find musical evidence um, of Jews who came into Leipzig the one time in the year when they were allowed in, which was during the trade fairs. Um, and so there were Jewish musicians among these visitors, right? So the, the Jews were sort of a big part of these trade fairs and, um, and they were allowed in because of all of the business that they brought with them. Um, and you, know, you can sort of see some, some of the anti-Jewish tropes there regarding you know, Jews and their business acumen or their money gr grubbiness, things like that. Um, but they, there were musicians among those who came to the trade fairs. Um, and it's not clear that they were perceived as being unmusical. They were entertainers. They were, they were valued for the entertainment that they brought with them. It doesn't mean that they were treated nicely. Right. Um, but here was, a, the, Paul's work I think is, um, is complexifying that picture. Um, so you know, rather than just talking about kind of representation, on the part of Bach and Telemann and other composers like those, we can actually start to think about what Jews were doing musically during this period. And there's so little evidence of it that even the fact that we now know that there were Jews who were coming and being musical in Leipzig, even for that one time a year, already starts to kind of uh, you know, poke holes in, in the broader uh, stereotypes and misconceptions. That leads me to my next question for you very nicely, <laughs> um, which is what were Jewish musicians doing during this time? And were there Jewish musicians in the early modern period um, and in the modern period that were instrumental in reviving performances of Bach's passions, working with the Bach's, Bach family after his death? And if so, uh, who were they and what are their stories? These, this, these are big questions. We should make way for others too. Um, <laughs> but um, so just uh, briefly, you know, there, yes, of course, there were Jewish musicians. The vast majority of their activities, their, their work as musicians, their play as musicians, um, is undocumented because they often did not use musical notation to write down what they were doing. But we know that Jews across Europe were essentially involved in things like instrument manufacture, instrument design and innovation, um, collecting collecting books and distributing them, sell books of music, among other things, um, distributing them, selling them, renting them out. Um, and they were making, you know, making music internally within their communities, in synagogues. They were making music, you know, among uh, the larger Christian, predominantly Christian communities in which they lived. Um, so yes, there, there was a lot of musical activity and much of it is simply undocumented. So it's very hard to kind of revive the way that we like to revive early music. Um, you know, like music by Bach and other composers that is notated fully and that we can actually, we can actually kind of make sense of harmonically, rhythmically, melodically. Um, but in the second half of the 18th century, the last decades of the 18th century, um, among the Bach enthusiasts who were kind of essential in preserving his legacy um, was a, a kind of a, a family of um, 
Jews in, in, in Berlin, predominantly in the city of Berlin, um, one of whom uh, was, her name was Sarah Itzik. She later married someone named Levy, so Sarah Levy became her name. Um, she was a student, apparently, of Wilhelm Friedemann Bach, so one of the Bach sons. Um, and it's, it's just sort of remarkable to pause over the fact that in a single generation, Right, you have, or even within within 20 years, you have 25 years, you have a situation where you know the the Bach father lived in a, a quite a closed, I would say, closed philosophical environment, uh, had quite a closed worldview, at least as far as um, what we might call diversity today. Um, and uh, within 25 years, his son is acting as as teacher, paid teacher to um, a Jewish woman, one of the kind of wealthiest families of Berlin. Her father helped to fund uh, the Seven Years' War um, for Frederick Frederick the Great. Um, so the Levy, Sarah Levy and her family um, became involved in collecting music by Bach. They, pre, they mostly did not collect vocal music. And this was not so, so uncommon of this generation. So thinking like 1775 forward, they were collecting instrumental music. They were collecting you know, copies of the well-tempered clavier, um, the things that, that we still use today to learn you know, keyboard music, partitas, the suites, um, some you know, chamber music, um, music to be made among friends um, and they would do that in their home they would host they would have salons they would have um, kind of you know musical parties um, so they were in a sense taking the Bach tradition and claiming it resituating it almost reappropriating it if you will within a Jewish environment and Sarah Levy was uh, she was one of the uh, sort of earliest reforming Jews in Berlin um, so you know, not strictly orthodox, let's say, but she was she was firmly Jewish. She kind of insisted on um, on a Jewish identity for herself. She was the great aunt to Felix Mendelssohn. Uh, Mendelssohn, of course, um, was uh, baptized as a child. Uh, that was a decision that his parents made, but he seems to have wholeheartedly embraced a Christian outlook, um, although he was kind of uh, tracked by that Jewish heritage for his whole life. Um, and so, yes, the, the legacy of J.S. Bach is essentially tied up uh, with, with Jewish history as well. Um, you know, I am a, I'm a Jewish woman, I'm a musicologist, I'm a Bach enthusiast uh, in many ways, um, but I, I lived for a long time with the sense that J.S. Bach would not really know what to do with me if he met me walking down the street. Um, and, and I felt in a way, uh, without trying to kind of impose myself on Sarah Levy, just thinking about her gave me a path in. Um, and, and so that kind of that process of rethinking what Bach can mean and the idea that we have the capacity to reinterpret the legacy of Bach the way that she did, um, I think can be a little bit empowering. Thank you. Uh, this question was submitted to me by no less than four people, including myself, excluding myself. So five people. Um, and it is uh, for Dr. Marsh, Dr. Sipis, and Dr. Marison. So I'll, I'll, I will let you. I will let you answer. Um, one of the modern Lutheran criticisms of historically informed Bach performance is that performers risk freezing Lutheranism at a turbulent time in its development by taking a, a, historic, a historicist revivalist approach, uh, and then repeating uh, what they think as modern theological errors over and over again in performance in performance in what becomes, uh, could be seen as a cult of Bach. Um, is it better to decontextualize uh, pieces in which we are putting them in their liturgical context, in which we are doing them in a church during Holy Week, or decontextualizing uh, them where we, where we take them away from Holy Week, where we, um, where we present them in a concert hall or a church that is not a part of in, in, in a service. Um, what are the pros and cons of each? And um, specifically to you, uh, Dr. Maris, and, um, you, your book is Bach and Modernity. Many of these cantatas also contain these pre-enlightened texts and which were written over a period of the, the Thirty Years' War uh, that divided Germany often along sectarian lines and depopulated much of Central Europe in the decades directly after that terrible conflict. How are today's musicians, our colleagues, um, reinterpreting these um, pre-enlightenment texts that seem to have little place in a modern open society? 
<laughs> That's a lot for everybody. To, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, well, maybe I'll just take part of that then. Um, you know, it can be intellectually interesting to discuss and argue whether Bach is more appropriate in the church or in the concert hall and so on, but it's kind of a, impractical. It's just not a real, it's, it's not something you can really do anything with because the harsh reality is that most churches don't want Bach's church vocal music in their liturgy. And even if they did, they can't afford it because <laughs> it's expensive. You know, that's one of the reasons they got rid of this kind of music in the later Lutheranism because people didn't want to pay for it. <laughs> And um, if you've got the Washington Bach concert or the or whoever, and, and, and that, you know, you, we, we all know that you have a board and you have wealthy people on the board that give money. Because even, even uh, no matter what kind of music you do, um, this is news to a lot of uh, professors. When I was a professor, I had no idea about these things. Very impractical, you know. But the harsh reality is that classical music is expensive. And the way it works is that wealthy people subsidize moderately wealthy people. <laughs> who subsidize people down that, that make it possible for a wide variety of people to go to the uh, concert. So the, the only real future for this kind of music really is in the concert hall. It's, it's, I don't see it ever um, getting into the liturgy per se. So uh, as nice as it might be to think of it, but, so that's on the one side as a practical matter, but as a sort of intellectual and theological matter, I would hope that this kind of stuff does not work its way into liturgy, even if they could afford it, because, uh, in a concert situation, you aren't expected to agree with what's being presented to you. It might be disturbing, but you can disagree with it. But the whole point of a liturgy, except with some exceptions, some people have aestheticized the liturgy too, but what a liturgy is supposed to be is you have a group of religious people together who promote their religious beliefs and their community values and so on. And these, what, these, what this piece is about is something that most people wouldn't accept as a good community value even in Lutheranism nowadays, unless they were anti-Semites. But modern anti-Semite Lutheran Germans, they don't want to pay for this, as I say. <laughs> and they don't, they don't want to listen to this kind of music at all. So it's sort of a kind of a, it's, 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 it's kind of a false problem, I guess, in a way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would agree that uh, even when St. John or St. Matthew Passion are performed, say, during Lent, even during Holy Week, even during Good Friday, uh, it's very rarely, and according to any sort of liturgical, uh, it, it's sort of uh, an accoutrement uh, to everything else that's going on, sort of music to pray by, music to mm -hmm. think by, uh, really. And, uh, but isn't it kind of a marketing strategy, like you're more likely to sell tickets if you do it around that time of year? Well, we'll see. I mean, we're doing something different uh, this year it's great, yeah. uh, by doing it on October 1st, and uh, the word is that the tickets are selling. Um, but, but you know, one, one thing about the way both passions are set up that sometimes it, it's too obvious to mention is you always have a part one and two. Uh, but there's something that goes in between those two parts that's never mentioned. And that was really for 18th century Lutherans, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, to be that was really the star attraction of the whole thing, and that's the sermon. Uh, and so while on the one hand we're able to look at the evidence of the music itself and extrapolate uh, ideals, theologically speaking, that are appropriate to the period, all of the above and then some may have come out in the sermon as well, and that's something we'll never know. Uh, but I remember once doing a performance of St. John at uh, Indiana University, I had a conductor, a guest conductor come in to do it. And in the announcement in the beginning, uh, having to say, you know, uh, in Bach's time, there would probably be a sermon of about two hours uh, in, in the middle of this. And I think the extent to which we're going to take historical performance might end right about there. Uh, but, but it's really, it, it's, and, and, you know, when we talk about, um, what's it, uh, Professor Sipas just mentioned a, a very interesting point about how Bach's music and other contexts, uh, particularly instrumental music, knowing that after Bach's music died a bit in obscurity, what did survive were publications of well-tempered clavier, uh, technique books to teach keyboard players uh, uh, how to play. Um, but Bach, of course, could reappropriate and did his own music all the time. 
So take, for example, uh, an aria from uh, Hercules, this uh, ostensibly secular cantata that he reuses in Christmas oratorio uh, that, that's performed very differently. Same music, different words, the idea of contrafactum, which means you use the same music, uh, but with a different text, was hardly a new one. Uh, it been happening since the Middle Ages. Um, so we have to ask ourselves, even though uh, when we talk about the way music is put together, how people heard it, uh, that there's a very, very strong rhetorical vein going through the whole thing, but that can all be changed at the stroke of a pen. And um, so maybe in considering that ideal as, way, uh, as well, vis-a-vis -vis what we might do now uh, without skirting the issue, uh, that is a solution that remains to be found. If I could just pick up on that, Dana, because I think what you're describing is really exciting. Um, the, the thing that scares me more than anything is the sacralizing of mm. Bach. Mm. And, you know, if you look literally anywhere on the internet for sort of descriptions of Bach's music, uh, the hand of God is Bach very, is God, very God often is Bach, invoked. And how, dare very... you, and how dare you question it? The exactly. fifth evangelist. So, I remember so we, I, was, so we... I was watching, I was, I was looking at, a, at the uh, Leipzig uh, Bach uh, festival page, and they they gave a, a an example of how Bach is God, and this one very offended Italian Catholic woman said Bach isn't God, and she was she was immediately said, "How dare you question this orthodoxy? We have a bronze statue of Bach, of Bach in front of uh, right. uh, Leipzig, and even Yu Zhao Wang, uh, you know, genuflected in front of it." Right, and so I think it, not only does that view of Bach as sacred he himself is sacred and his music is somehow sacred and untouchable not only does it sort of give rise to a lot of these kind of uncomfortable issues that we're talking about or it it perpetuates many of the uncomfortable perspectives but in addition it stifles musical creativity um so let's recompose the saint Matt, saint john passion for as, as a bunch of concertos and see where that leads us i don't know <laughs> i mean just really kind of exploding and thinking about you know, thinking about that idea of contrafact, I don't know, why not? Yeah. yeah. And, and how, are, how are contemporary musicians reinterpreting these texts and reinterpreting, um, re, yeah, <laughs> we call <it> reinterpreting, uh, <laughs> reinterpreting these, these, these questions, which brings us to uh, Alicia. Um, as a Jewish performer, what have your experiences been? with anti-Semitism in Baroque pieces like St. John and some of the cantatas, and how do you reinterpret them yes. as a Jewish musician? Yes, so it is a long and complicated answer, <laughs> um, and I was nodding my head vigorously when you were talking about your experience of thinking of what would Bach need to me, mm -hmm. um, and that reminded me so much of um, right after I had visited Leipzig for the first time, um, I was taking a class about um, Hasidut, about Hasidic um, mystical literature, and my professor, um, who was a, qu a queer um, neo-Hasidic man, had just come back from visiting the grave of Rebbe Nachman, who is one of the great Hasidic masters from, um, from whom we, we get just an incredible body of this mystical literature and storytelling. And my professor said, I stood at Rebbe Nachman's grave, who has been responsible for so much of my scholarship and my spiritual learning and reflection, and I thought he would utterly reject who I am. <laughs> and I think that's so complicated. Oh, sure. Thank you. Uh, it's so complicated for those of us who have a deep love of an artist, a composer, a writer, a theologian who is human and imperfect. And when we know that if they were, if we could take a time machine back to when they lived, <laughs> they might have nothing to do with us. It's very painful. And some people respond to it by throwing their hands up and saying, we should throw it all out. And I don't think any of us would say that at all. But the reason we're here is that we think it's so important to contextualize it and also to not excuse it for the things that are painful and the things that have caused harm and led to violence. Um, and so that leads me to, to my experience as a Jewish musician who performs this music. It, um, it is deeply gratifying to sing Bach and to sing Bach with incredible colleagues and under such incredible direction. And also it's deeply painful as a Jewish musician. 
And I remember the first time I ever sang the St. John Passion in music school. Um, I didn't know how I was going to feel going into it. I was very trepidatious. And I um, luckily had a conductor who was very thoughtful about holding all of our feelings around it and really listened to us and listened to us as we processed it. And I was fascinated to hear the two of you talking about how even if we had no text for the St. John Passion, mm -hmm. the way the music is written and the way the different characters are characterized through the music, it tells its own story. You know, as we would say, it's a drosh, it's a sermon of its own. The music speaks for itself. And this idea of harmony versus chaos is so evident in the way the music is written. And as a Jewish person singing these turba choruses where the crowd is yelling, crucify him, crucify him, you hear that in the music. And it's very disturbing as a Jewish musician to sing it. Um, so that's one of the things I've always grappled with and I don't think I will ever get over, which I think is important. We shouldn't get over it. We should keep talking about it. Um, but what I will say, what has helped me be able to sit with it and to keep performing it, because I won't stop, <laughs> is to know that people are having this conversation and that people are um, not allowing it to, not allowing it to be swept under the rug and that we are talking to our audiences and our congregations about the real harm and pain that has been caused by this tradition and also saying there is so much value in continuing to perform it. So for me, my, my personal belief is I find beauty and holiness wherever people are coming together in community to share their sacred tradition and to share music. And I find that in a synagogue when I am on the bima with Rabbi Eric, as I was so, so privileged to do over um, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And I also feel it is such a gift to be performing the St. John Passion because I know it is part of a sacred tradition for, for our, our Christian siblings. And I find that a privilege as well. Um, and the fact that we can have these conversations and educate people about the parts of the text that are thorny, that are violent, that are ugly is so important. Wow. So much uh, of Baroque music Revolves around Christian, revolves around Christianity and church spaces and church theology, um, or even in the context of church services. And, and you and I do quite a bit of that. We often we sing, we, we have our church gigs. Um, but your ensemble, Miriam, recenters Baroque expression in a Jewish context and um, showcases, while showcasing Jewish performers, you also cast a different light. Um, on the subject by Christian composers uh, that have been appropriated, that, that have appropriated Hebrew scriptures, then you have been reappropriated as, as Jewish in context. Can you tell me more about your work and what can we, Baroque uh, classical music, music organizations, do to make our spaces more inclusive towards Jewish performers, especially when performing works that are imbued with anti Semitism? Yes. I am very gratified that within the past few years, there has been a huge movement to make early music, to expand the definition of what is early music and to make it more inclusive. And, and it's something that um, I'm across the whole classical community, classical music community as well, but especially in early music because we are scholars. <laughs> um, and um, so my, my desire to create Miriam really came out of feeling fragmented as a Jewish person and as a performer of Baroque music, that these two parts of my identity felt separate. And there was this cognitive dissonance between what does it mean to be a Jewish person and what does it mean to be a classical musician? And I was having these conversations with my other Jewish musical colleagues who felt the same way. And I realized this is not something that is limited to me. Um, <laughs> and my particular way of, of harmonizing these parts of my identity was to figure out how I could bridge these two musical languages. And I found that there is so much richness in 
sitting in these liminal spaces or in these intersectional spaces where identity is really complicated, where it's tricky, where it's awkward, and that if we allow ourselves to delve into it and not be afraid and really figure out specificity of language and live into that, that there's so much beauty that comes out of it. And so what I found really, really gratifying is to figure out how to bring early music into Jewish spaces, because so much of the music that we love by these great composers, settings of Jewish texts, and I believe that that music belongs to us as Jewish people as well and belongs in Jewish spaces. And it's been um, an incredible pleasure to be able to bridge that gap and to bring early music to, to Jewish folks and to bring that conversation um, outside of the synagogue as well. So Ian, is it okay if I just jump in Please. to uh, sort of enhance and, and applaud, you know, what Alicia is doing and talking about here? I think it is worth noting that in the post-war world, especially in the United States, Jews have played um, a remarkably significant role in the revival of early music. Um, from Noah Greenberg and his approach to, you know, kind of medieval repertoire, to Joshua Rifkin and many others who have revolutionized the way that we perform Bach and think about historical performance with respect to Bach. Um, so in a sense, what Alicia is doing is making visible and audible a tendency that was already present. Um, and so building on that tradition and really making it um, you know, very prominent and available to people to really consider. And so you know, kudos to you for, for you. the work that you're doing. Uh, Alicia and, and, and Rabbi Abed, I want to bring you into this conversation as we leave the, the 18th century behind and are getting into how we deal with anti-Semitism in our, in our modern lives, both as Jews and as musicians. Um, uh, Rabbi, how has historical anti-Semitism, including the charge of deicide that we see in Bach St. Matthew's Passion, informed and inflamed modern anti-Semitism? Sure. Yep. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna share. I'm also our lead AV. I'm also our lead AV technician, and so here we are. Um, first of all, thank you all for being here on behalf of uh, Bethesda Jewish Congregation, and uh, again, BHBC and the mosque. Um, you, know, you, you talked about moving forward in time to talk about this, and I actually think to to talk about it, we actually have to go backwards in time. My very first undergraduate class, upper level class, my freshman year was about the history of anti-Semitism. And my professor back then, Dr. Jay Berkowitz, broke the history of anti-Semitism into three phases. I think maybe he added a fourth, I'm going to add a fourth for sure, because that really talks about where we are today. And the first, way before even anti-Semitism was a term, right, because that was in the 19th century, we had what I would maybe call political anti-Jewishness. And there was nothing particularly anti it wasn't specifically anti Jewish in the sense of oh you're Jewish we're going to harm you or anything like that it was oh you're different so the Romans didn't Jews as the other Jews as the other exactly and not necessarily because and not because oh you're oh you're the Jew you're the demon you're whatever but oh you're rebelling against us in Judea okay fine yeah we don't like that we're gonna we're gonna burn Jerusalem now there are some people who say it was anti-Jewish and there's some people who say no actually they were pretty pro-Jewish except for the rebellion thing so there's that but it did set up the other which then moves into what we've yeah which what but then that moves into what we've been talking about which is the religious anti-Semitism and that begins with everything we're talking about the the New Testament Christian Bible uh, and the roots of Christianity coming forth from Judaism and these two you know back then it was it wasn't Christianity and Judaism at first. It was Jews who believed one thing and Jews who believed a different thing. And they got along sometimes and they get along sometimes. But then as soon as one group of them had power, things changed. Um, and you know, we're talking about the successionism. Uh, we're also talking about uh, like St. Augustine, right? Who says to, um, you know, how, what do we do with the Jews? Well, we have to degrade them so that they prove that we're right. Um, and that for a long time, you know, some people took that more seriously than others, but that for a long time uh, led the religious persecution of Jews, uh, which 
leads to all the trope, many of the tropes that we see today, um, especially in medieval Europe, you had the big one, the blood libel, right? That Jews would use uh, Christian bodies or blood for their rituals to make matzah. It's extra painful because according to Kashrut, we're not supposed to eat the blood of an animal. We're supposed to drain it fully. So it, it took on all this extra pain. There was also a uh, usury l uh, lending with interest. Christians couldn't do it. Jews could. And so then we get to this point of, oh, Jews are good with money. And all these things happen because Jews were a different religion and the other religion and the, the religion that we, you know, some Christian. Also, as we say Christians, like we're acknowledging, right, that these are some Christians and some Christian leaders and not every Christian, you know, as a whole. Um, but these led to a lot of the tropes that we have today. Jews are greedy, Jews uh, have the, uh, the blood of Christian babies, the blood libel, uh, and deicide is a big part of that. In some ways, it's the root of all of it. Well, why would Jews use Christian blood? Well, because they killed Christ, so of course they're going to do it again. Uh, and that serves as a root of this. The third phase came as uh, with emancipation and uh, and the enlightenment and rationalism and all these things were suddenly um oh jews have more rights they can move out of the ghetto well what makes them different if not their religion if we're all kind of less religious in general and as um so not only were they gaining rights but their science was big but along with science became the science of race People saying, oh, the size of, we talked about this earlier, the size of your nose tells you everything about your brain and what you can do, all these things. Um, and so with all that became racial anti-Semitism, where you know, in the middle, middle Ages, if you were Jewish and you converted to Christianity, great. But now, and we see this with the Nazis, right? Now in the you know, 1700s, 1800s, 1900s, if you're Jewish and you convert, the Nazis didn't care. Right? If you had one Jewish drop of blood, that could be enough. If you had one Jewish grandparent, that could be enough. Um, I say all this because the tropes and the trends of anti-Semitism, I'm sorry, there's one more. The fourth stage is modern, which is Israel, now plays a new role um, where we see anti-Semitism overlap with anti-Zionism. It's not always the same, and it often is the same. And, and it's sometimes they're two separate things, right? Someone comes in and says, I love Israel, but I hate Benjamin Netanyahu, probably not that anti-Semitic. Someone who says, oh, every country gets to exist except Israel, that's a little anti-Semitic. Uh, and that's the fourth stage. And I say all this because they all build one on the other on the other, where we get to a point where it's blurry and they overlap and they intersect. I looked up a bunch of examples coming into this, uh, and so I need to use my cheat sheet here. Um, one of them, one example I found was uh, just two years ago, 2021, a protest in Miami, an anti Israel protest in Miami that said, Jesus was Palestinian and you killed him too. Jesus was Palestinian and you killed him too. There is the trope of deicide blending with this fourth modern stage of anti-Zionism and anti-Israel, uh, anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism overlapping. Um, there are plenty of others, the blood libel we see today uh, as well. You'll see images of, uh, you know, Israelis, uh, Israeli soldiers eating Palestinian children or something like that, or, or you see the blood libel, especially with Israel, but you see it elsewhere. Um, so that we get to a point today where it's not clear. There are two great examples which uh, that, that come to mind um, and and um, and they're they're local they're they're let me uh, yeah there's Charlottesville right which was Jews will not replace us it was very much in that racial third category of uh, oh we're we're white Jews are not and they're different and they're going to come over and take take over because of globalism and all these things and that was clearly rooted in anti-Semitism in the tropes in, uh, you could tr probably trace it back to blood libel, to deicide. Right here in Montgomery County, just uh, a year ago, uh, almost, uh, we had spray paint on the Bethesda trolley trail uh, that said, uh, I don't even remember, it was something like kill all the Jews. Uh, and, and it had swastika symbols, but there was nothing there. Like it didn't speak of the blood li libel, it didn't speak of deicide. But clearly it's anti Semitic. And so we get to a point where sometimes we see deicide led to blood libel, which led to racial tropes, which lead to what we see today. And sometimes it just exists. Thank you. Um, I, I, you, you answered some of my, some of my question, sure. which is about 
how specifically in the past six years, um, how does anti-Semitism continue continue to to influence our communities? I know I know Dr. Marsh has to run, so I'm going to I'm going to ask him one more question before he does, uh, and then I will get right back to you. And, and that is for practical considerations. Why might an ensemble choose to perform Bach St. Matthew's Passion over his uh, sorry Bach St. John's Passion over his St. Matthew's Passion, um, which is more general in placing blame? Um, for Jesus's death and contains more of a narrative such as the First Communion and the Jesus's prayers at Gethsemane, while St. John's is only Jesus's trial and crucifixions. What are the practical, practical considerations uh, here that directly affect programming for us organizers? Right, well, uh, traditionally, I think uh, St. John has ended up with much higher frequency of performance because it's cheaper to put on. Uh, you don't have to have two orchestras and two choruses. And one uh, in your piano of, of, of... And, and yeah, exactly. And, and additionally uh, to that, quite frankly, I don't really see the St. Matthew Passion as being particularly less uh, anti-Semitic as the John. The John is just a little more explicit in, right. in, in the face, but there's plenty in St. Matthew that really... Uh, gets all to the same points that uh, were just made. So, um, no, it's, it's, a, it's a really tough one. And, and for me, um, having grown up in a church choir school um, and sung St. John the first time when I think I was 11, uh, these conversations, especially just in, in the, we had a number of conversations leading up to today, and I'll tell you, uh, I really, I see the whole thing <laughs> in a very different way. I mean, I think to myself, um, wow, these folks are incredibly gracious <laughs> uh, about the attitude of, of still wanting to perform this music, still seeing, looking and find, looking for and finding value in it, uh, despite the the obvious uh, horrors that are, that are there, um, and it's you know I I agree with Alicia that it, it's we don't the idea of music from a purely musical standpoint uh, not quite throwing it out with with the bathwater as it were. What do you what do you see the future of performance of Saint Matthew's and Saint John's Passion are? I know uh, uh, many on many Bach ensembles across across the world have them on rotation. Like we do, we yeah. do one, we do uh, one one Passion a year. Um, yeah. There was there was a, one festival in, in Minneapolis who or, or Minnesota that um, started out their their Bach roots. Uh, um, diversity uh, program by performing St. John's. Um, what is there, <laughs> what, what does the future look like in terms of, yeah. in terms of having these pieces in the constantly performed repertoire? Well, for certain, one thing that really starts to bring us further is having these conversations as, as sort of creating sparks of education. Uh, and I think something like uh, Professor Morrison's book, Just Out, Bach Against Modernity, just out from Oxford University Press, uh, is a, has within its chapters a great sort of precis on precisely the issues we're talking about. And I can remember from many years ago, it sort of being in the air, there, there being this controversy, but it was never, you know, I haven't had to deal with uh, racial slurs or vandalism or you know i'm not coming from that perspective so i it's precisely these conversations that someone like me who's not had to suffer those kind of things that's we need it's all about being compassionate uh with and and being able to identify uh with our fellow human beings i mean uh, that's and that's how I, I think one just has to be incredibly 
thorough and not skirt around any issues and and deal with deal with them absolutely head on and and reform our own thinking as as we learn more from others so this is a question that was posed by several online um if anti-semitic pieces or pieces that are imbued with anti-semitism um and this is this is also for everybody on stage please um what do we owe as socially conscious classical musicians to our Jewish neighbors and to Jewish communities? Roy Abbott, would you like to, would you like to start? You did not describe me, but um, I am not a classically trained musician, but I can speak from the Jewish side. Um, I don't know the answer, I think, and we've talked about do we do you perform it as is? Do you change the words? Do you do so with education? Um, there is the fourth option that that I think we've touched on, which is not to do it at all. Um, and that's it's hard, right? How do you what do you do when the words hurt and the music is so powerful? Um, the example that's been running through my head is, uh, is 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 the movie Dumbo, the Disney film Dumbo, where Disney Plus has now has a you know, a screen ahead of time saying this, uh, some may see this as culturally insensitive or whatever language they use, perhaps it's stronger than that, uh, because Dumbo has all sorts of racial stereotypes. Um, and there's a question with Dumbo, do you watch the film and have that and, and then you can talk about it, right? If I were to show my kids, what would I would I say, oh, here's why this was wrong in so many ways? Or do I just not show it? Uh, but the challenge is that works when it's a Disney film, it doesn't work when this is tied so much to something that's part of uh, so many Christians faith. Uh, so I don't know the answer. I think the best two are exactly as we're doing in the education or, uh, or there is the question of do you just not do it and you move on? Please. Yeah, I've got asked get asked that a lot too. And what I always say is that, um, you know, as music historians, we're not policy makers, <laughs> we can sort of advise. <laughs> Or at least give the background information, and, you, and people who need to make the more difficult decisions can make them. But then they would press you. But so, so seriously, what do you really think? And so I says, I personally think that it's important not to take the option of not doing it, and it's not because the stuff is so great and so on. Although it is great, the reason to not go with that option is that uh, my experience, uh, as, as I often say, I'm in my seventh decade on this vile orb. <laughs> 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 and, and my experience has been that people. Um, Many Jews and many Christians and many esthetes and uh, so on would not be exposed to other points of view. They sort of, many Jews, I'm sorry, hold on, so, 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 but not sound too obnoxious, but many Jews and many Christians and many esthetes and many musicians absolutize their own sort of perspective and are never forced to look at things in another way. It doesn't mean that you're in danger of becoming something else that you don't want to be. Um, but it's just it's it's good to be it's, it's good to be these things wouldn't happen these discussions wouldn't happen if it, this is an unusual place that we're in here that in that this is one of uh, a church and synagogue in the same building I've, that's the only one I've ever heard of in the United States fantastic but that's very unusual and I've heard many people say they've never thought about these things at all and never would have thought about them if they weren't confronted with the fact that people are upset about the fact that they're doing the John Passion or the or the or the or the Matthew passion. So I think it's it's and the the additional tricky thing I find over and over and over again is that a lot of the dialogue, even on the Jewish Christian dialogue side of things, it's some of it's religious Christians with religious Jews dialogue, which is its own kind of dialogue. And then there's non-observant Christians and non-observant Jews who also feel very strongly about Bach and how do you sort of negotiate all of this? There's just a lot of stuff going on there. And so to the secularists, I just say, well, you should be a decent human being. And, and to the religious folks, I say, well, look, you know, I, I find it very interesting, for example, that Jesus is lauded by so many people for having said, you should love your neighbor as yourself. And they don't, ironically don't realize he's just quoting the Hebrew Bible <laughs> when he said that. And they like, really? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's right out of Leviticus. You know? <laughs> That's fantastic. People should know that, you know, that there, there is these uncomfortable pieces like this, but there's a lot of wonderful things that could be brought together that won't happen unless you have these kinds of opportunities. I guess that's what I'm essentially saying. Oh yeah, um, and if I could jump in. Um, so I think if we 
take that option of simply not performing this music, anti-Semitism and anti-Judaism don't go away. It's in the water and so to speak, and it is bound up with white supremacy. And if we ignore it, then we are denying ourselves the opportunity to attack it head on. And it's so important to be aware and to give people the vocabulary to be able to have these kinds of discussions, because if we don't, then it still exists and it permeates the way we think, the way we treat each other, and the way society operates. So I would much rather have it be brought up to the surface and have a frank discussion about it rather than pretend it doesn't exist just by, um, just by removing one piece. I, um, I don't wanna speak for anybody else, but there are a couple of ideas that have come into my head. One is that there is a third option, right? But somewhere between continuing to perform it and not continuing to perform it, a work like the John Passion, and that is performing it less often. Um, and actually, um, that sort of resonates with the suggestion I made before about looking for ways to desacralize Bach and desacralize this music. Um, I know an ensemble that has recorded it no less than 11 times. That's too many. The world doesn't need that many recordings by one ensemble of the Bach, of the John Passion. I'm sorry. I mean, I, I think that um, there is a lot of creative programming that's going on. Leading ensembles are doing extensive research into early musical practices of Jews, among many others. Um, and it's time for us to tip the balance a little bit more and, and you know, really do some of that hard work of research and understanding and creative programming um, to sort of re revive and reimagine Jewish musical practices of the past. Um, the other thing that I, I just wanted to kind of respond to the notion, well, I love being called gracious. Uh, thank you, Dana. Um, and again, not speaking for anybody else. I feel that this music belongs to me too. Um, and that's, you know, there are lots of, as a musicologist, I get asked a lot, what is Jewish music? And like that, that's a question I really don't want to deal with. I don't like the, the whole premise of the question is kind of silly to me. I, I'm not interested in the discussion, but surely Jewish music at its core is music that's made by Jews. And so if Jews are participating in it's the Jewish making music. of the John Passion and singing solos and you know putting on performances and helping to rethink the way that we perform this music through contributions and scholarship and performance, then it is it belongs to Jews as well. And that is an uncomfortable paradox. And I know Dana needs to leave, so I'll stop yeah. talking there. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. March. So sorry. Uh, he has to go and, and to Dr. Herschel, and I'll see you in a moment. Um, we're going, we're going to, to close with this last question. And this is for everybody, and I want to start it off with Rabbi Abbott as the leader of this community. And that is, even as anti-Semitism rises in the United States, what are some areas of hope as we look to the future? I think, I mean, the biggest one is right here, right? The fact that we're doing not only this, but the, the church and the synagogue and, and, and the mosques all coming together uh, and knowing that, uh, you know, when that anti-Semitic incident happened on the Bethesda trolley trail, right? We had people reaching out to us and, and checking in. And I know if something happened here, uh, I know uh, Reverend David Gray would be the first to reach out and we'd be immediately in conversation um, and, and just knowing that there's trust and knowing that there's, uh, I don't know, that's a beautiful thing. As you said, no place like this, Covenant Hall. Look at the space, nowhere like this. I'll echo what Rabbi Eric said. Trust each other, talk to each other, trust that people want to learn and to do better and, and have the conversation and do the work. We have the capacity to remake musical meaning and artistic meaning broadly um, by re-engaging with music and having these conversations and thinking about it and performing it in new ways um, and you know doing kind of radical things with performance. I think that we can actually um, start to take apart some of the um, the dangerous ideas that are embedded in, in this music. Truth matters. And with that, I'd like to thank <laughs> our distinguished panel. Thank you, Bethesda Jewish Congregation. Thank you, Bradley Hills Presbyterian Church. And thank all of you for attending this. And uh, please go home and keep the conversation going in your
their own lives. Uh, I mean, comrades, thank you so much.